All right, everybody, welcome to part two of our exploration of spiritual awakening. Now, I'd like to say right off the bat that I was quite a bit ambitious when I chose this topic of spiritual awakening. All the different moral traditions in the world, religious or secular, have various paths to spiritual rebirth or growth. And I realized early on in my research that I had to choose just a few examples for these presentations. So I decided to choose examples from traditions that I think are most familiar to us. So I hope you're fine with that. Spiritual awakening in the West is often understood as an individualistic pursuit. We examined the Christian mystical path last week and may have seen it as a program meant to enlighten us personally and help us experience direct contact with divinity, however that is defined. But because divinity in the Christian tradition is defined as love, such human divine contact comes with a side benefit. It makes us more interested in our fellow beings. But what has actually happened in this journey of the Christian mystic is that a part of our ego, our sense of being an individual self, separate from others, has died. And so we no longer see ourselves in a strictly individualistic way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, so sums up the Jewish moral commandments. But once one goes on the mystic's path, this loving our neighbor as ourself becomes something natural, something that we want to do. In the East, awakening is often characterized as the loss of the individual ego, so that one experiences not only union with the divinity, but with fellow beings. Therefore, it should result in greater compassion as well. So you might say there's more overlap of these two approaches to spiritual awakening than it first appears. Often the fruits of these different paths look and taste very similar. However, it must be stated that the differences in Eastern and Western forms of spiritual life are evaporating, as East literally has met West culturally. The East has adopted Western values and spiritual perspectives and vice versa. As we shall see, this cross-pollination between East and West actually began long ago. It's just happening now more rapidly. Because this topic is so large and we have limited time, I chose to focus on the Eastern path that has gained the most interest and found the most adherence in the West, Buddhism. Many in the West have adopted the meditative or mindfulness techniques of Buddhism, but left the rest of the teaching aside. So they see Buddhism then as merely a practice or a philosophy and not a religion. I, at one point, uh, characterized myself as a Buddhist Christian. And that was because uh, I kept my Christian faith, but I meditated. <laughs> now I'm not so sure that's a helpful terminology. The truth is more complicated than this, especially when we look at the most popular form of Buddhism in the world, the Mahayana form, which translates from the Sanskrit as the greater vehicle. It's believed by most historians that Buddhism began with the teachings of Gautama Buddha, who lived near the border of Nepal and India, sometime between the 6th and 4th centuries BCE. Here is the basic problem as Buddhists see it, and I'm going to be very general. There's way too many details in all of these religious traditions to explain every bit of them, so I'm just going to be very general. So those of you who are practitioners, forgive me for that. But here's the basic problem as Buddhists see it, with us human beings, which necessitates a spiritual awakening. Buddhism believes that all dissatisfaction with life or suffering is caused by desire or craving. It's also caused by our ignorance of the true nature of reality, namely the impermanence of all things of this world. And part of what causes us to crave the impermanent things of this world is the false belief in a permanent self or ego that wants to find lasting satisfaction in this world. Spiritual awakening in Buddhism is then the overcoming of the suffering through the cessation of craving and desire and accepting the impertinence, impermanence, I'm sorry, of the self to the point of the union of our consciousness with 
the great consciousness. This union is called nirvana. It is the goal of the Buddhist spiritual path. Only when we reach nirvana do we break the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth over millennia, if not millions of years, if not more than millions of years, that our spirit experiences. Escape from this cycle of rebirth is accomplished through meditative practices and the adoption of certain moral teachings over the course of many, many, many lifetimes. Traditionally, this was only possible by withdrawing from regular society and becoming a monk, repeatedly <laughs> becoming a monk over and over. So it was a very daunting task to become enlightened in classical Buddhist teaching. Now, Mahayana Buddhism is, if I can call it this, a friendlier form of Buddhism to us in the West because it has a concept of a savior figure who can help us along the path, speed it up, so to speak, and who is so enlightened, this bodhisattva could enter nirvana if they wanted to, but instead they return to help the rest of us along the path. There have been many bodhisattvas in history. In fact, Jesus is often referred to by many Buddhists as one of the more significant bodhisattvas. Now, I want you to listen to this description of the Bodhisattva's role from a classic text on the history of Indian culture. The Bodhisattva was thought of as a spirit, not only of compassion, but also of suffering. In more than one source, we read the vow or resolve of the Bodhisattva, which is sometimes expressed in almost Christian terms. I take upon myself the deeds of all beings, even of those in the hells, in other worlds, in the realms of punishment. I take their suffering upon me. I bear it. I do not draw back from it. I do not tremble at it. I have no fear of it. I do not lose heart. I must bear the burden of all beings, for I have vowed to save all things living, to bring them safe through the forest of birth, age, disease, death, and rebirth. I think not of my own salvation, but strive to bestow on all beings the royalty of supreme wisdom. So I take upon myself all the sorrows of all beings. I resolve to bear every torment in every purgatory of the universe. For it is better that I alone suffer than the multitude of living beings. I give myself in exchange. I redeem the universe from the forest of purgatory, from the womb of flesh, from the realm of death. I agree to suffer as a ransom for all beings, for the sake of all beings. Truly, I will not abandon them, for I have resolved to gain supreme wisdom for the sake of all that lives, to save the world. The writer says, the suffering bodhisattva so closely resembles the Christian conception of the God who gives his life as a ransom for many that we cannot dismiss the possibility that the doctrine was borrowed by Buddhism from Christianity. I'm bringing this up because I brought up the point earlier that East and West did meet in ancient history and influenced one another. And there is a Christian tradition, the Thomas tradition, that if you read its scriptures, sounds a lot like Buddhism. And here's another quote from another historian. There were other aspects of Mahayana Buddhism which appear to have their origin outside India. Among these is the idea of the coming of the Maitreya Buddha to save the world, with which was connected the concept of the suffering savior, the Bodhisattva who redeems humanity through his own suffering. Evidently, the new beliefs current in Palestine were known to the Buddhist by this time. So the idea of Buddhism, that Buddhism is not a religion, and the idea that it has little connection with religious ideas that we're familiar with, like Christianity in the West, is a fallacy. Take a look at this image from the Sacre-Cœur Basilica in Paris, France. The Savior seated in teaching to an assembly of followers. Now compare it to this Korean image of the Shakyamuni Buddha preaching to his assembly of followers. Very similar iconography. 
However, despite the similarities, many types of Buddhism still appear as a challenging path to us. I think we need to be frank about that because of the seeming requirement to sit in an unnatural position for long periods of time and having to do this as a monk for many lifetimes. How many of us would comfortably contort our bodies into a position like this? With such art that you see here, a good marketing strategy? Well, apparently it was, since Buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world. And I do find the serenity on the face of these Buddhas inviting. But couldn't I sit in a nice cushiony chair to meditate and without the weird leg position? Well, there is one branch of Mahayana Buddhism, the Nichiren or Nichiren branch that has proven attractive to many Westerners. One reason I chose to focus on this particular brand of Buddhism this morning is because of the number of people in the arts who are followers of this brand of Buddhism, particularly actors and musicians. Now, I suspect this is because Nichiren's spiritual path is a mantra-based path, and actors and musicians have a profound appreciation for the power of the spoken word and for rhythm, which a mantra combines. Now, another reason I picked Nichiren Buddhism to focus on is because one of our members is a practicing Buddhist from the Nichiren school, and I've invited him to answer a few of my questions to kick off our Q&A once this presentation is done. In the 13th century in Japan, here's a little history, there was a Buddhist priest named Nichiren Daishonin. His dates are 1222 to 1282 CE, 1222 to 1282 CE, he stressed that all the Buddha's teaching was contained in one text, the Lotus Sutra. Now there are many, many Buddhist texts and they are not all in agreement. So emphasizing one text brought simplicity, coherence, and unity to the practice. This is an image of Nichiren and is from the picture album of the life of the holy priest Nichiren. It shows Nichiren praying at the top of the mountain where he would found his community as the sun is rising from the sea. Nichiren's followers and Nichiren himself believed he was a bodhisattva, a savior type figure who came to enlighten us. Particular to Nichiren was the belief that reciting the Japanese title of the Lotus Sutra like a mantra would lead adherents to spiritual awakening. The Japanese title is Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, and you can see it at the bottom of this slide. Saying these words over and over, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, over and over in a spirit of intense devotion and faith brings the promise of profound change. Now, there are many deeds attributed to Nichiren, which also gives it a religious type of quality, some of which may remind you of another miracle worker savior figure. Here, Nichiren calms a storm while his fearful followers are amazed. So here is the path of our spiritual development from lowest to highest, according to the Nichiren Buddhist teaching. These are called the 10 worlds, and the final four are where true spiritual awakening begins, the final four. The first six reveal why we need spiritual awakening and are in the realm of the cycle of rebirth. Hell dwellers is the lowest state of the human condition where we experience suffering and lack of mental freedom. At this stage, we are unable to do the good that we want to do. In fact, we don't even want to do good. Hungry spirits is the realm of spiritual and physical craving, which leaves us perpetually dissatisfied with life. The animal phase is where our actions are motivated by instinct. We seek immediate gratification and we lack the ability to make sound moral judgments. At the demigod stage is the realm of anger and judgment of other people. We wanna feel superior to others or, or we wanna feel liked by them to the point we will present a false self. We will be insincere in order to be accepted. At the human stage is the phase we, where we develop our ability to make moral judgments. 
We are able to use our rational abilities to determine right and wrong. And yet our minds are still faulty and they depend on willpower rather than a spirit greater than ourselves. Heavenly beings is the phase where we look to role models to guide us to achieve our desires. We often feel empowered by these role models, whether actual deities or saints or teachers. Yet whatever joy we receive in attaining our desires is transient. It doesn't last. And so we inevitably end up feeling dissatisfied until we acquire another desire. So now we're going to enter the world of spiritual awakenings with the voice hearers or learners. This is the stage where we receive the teachings of the Buddha and begin to act on them. We have truly begun the process of awakening. Cause awakened or realized ones is the stage where we realize our own powers and abilities to awaken. We realize we have the ability to control our instincts. However, at this previous stage, there is the temptation, at this stage, I'm sorry, and the previous stage, voice hearers and cause awakened, there is the temptation to self-centeredness and self-absorption. Spiritual narcissism, in other words, that we saw is a temptation also along the Western spiritual path of the mystic. Then we reach the bodhisattva stage. This is a stage where we are filled with compassion for all things, and we want to serve others. We genuinely feel empathy for the suffering of others and live to relieve that suffering. We become like a savior ourselves. And then finally, at the Buddha stage. At this stage in the Mahayana tradition, we are truly all compassionate and all wise. We have the capacity to experience complete joy that no circumstances in life can ever threaten. Perfection. Perfection in our life is possible at this stage. Now, I want to point out that these stages are not completely separate in the sense that once we move to a higher stage, we've completely left the previous ones. Here is how the Buddhist magazine Tricycle explains these levels. And I got a lot of my information from that magazine. It's a great for understanding Buddhism. In the magazine, uh, it stated all 10 worlds are mutually inclusive, each realm potentially containing all the others. In practice, this means that the 10 worlds are really 10 different life conditions that an individual might experience at any given time. A core teaching of Nichiren Buddhism is the mutual possession of the 10 worlds. In practice, this means that the karma of each lifetime, indeed of each moment, is fluid rather than fixed. Now, you remember karma is the sum of our actions in this life and all of our previous lives. And so we experience it as fate in this life. If we've done harm to in our previous lives, we're going to feel compelled to do harm in this rebirth, in this life. That's what karma is. But here in Nichiren Buddhism, that isn't fixed. It's not fate. It's fluid. Human beings are not at the mercy of conditions or their surroundings, but can transform any moment by chanting Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, which is the Japanese title of the Lotus Sutra. The realm of demigods, for instance, in which everything is seen as a potential threat can give way to the realm of the Bodhisattva through altruistic action toward others. It is therefore possible to manifest any of the 10 worlds, including Buddhahood, at any time. So just because one behaves at a lower level doesn't mean by reciting the mantra Nam Yoho Renge Kyo and following the moral teachings of the Buddha that one cannot elevate their consciousness several levels higher and with relative efficiency. But the opposite is true if one decides not to exercise control. Nichiren Buddhists believe that reciting the Nam Yoho Renge Kyo with intention and devotion releases a life force that both energizes and brings clarity of thought so that one is truly empowered to improve their life. Now, some of you may think this is strange or that it's like reciting a magical incantation. But think about the many Jews and Christians who believe reciting scripture 
or praying particular prayer, prayers repeatedly can also enliven the power of the Holy Spirit within them. Many secular people believe repeating affirmations continually, day after day, can manifest whatever goal they want to accomplish. So this isn't as foreign nor magical as it sounds. So now in closing, I would like to gain some insight from a practitioner of Nichiren Buddhism. Marco Miani grew up in Italy as a Catholic, but his spiritual practice is now as a Buddhist. Marco, please unmute yourself. Hi, Waverly. Hi, Marco. All right, I'm going to first ask you right off the bat. Do you still consider yourself a Catholic? There's a, a proverb in Italy that says, once you're born Catholic, you will remain Catholic, even if you dismiss the religion or go to another faith and this stuff. I would uh, tell you, no, I am deeply Buddhist. But this doesn't mean that I rejected all the values and teachings of Catholicism. It's actually the opposite, even because, as you correctly explained, many of the teaching, teachings of Buddhism are extremely similar, if not identical, to the teachings of Catholicism and Christianity in general. So my faith, my spiritual path now is Nietzsche and Buddhism. But nonetheless, many of the values and aspects of Catholicism and Christianity in general are still part of my being and my spiritual journey. Hmm. Well, it sounds like the Buddhist path has helped you follow a more Christ-like path. And so in some sense, I don't want to call you a Christian if you don't want to be called a Christian, but in a sense, you know, it has made you Christ-like in a way, a good Christian as far as your behavior and your spirit, the health of your spirit and your outlook on life we, is what it sounds like. We, we, we say that we are good human beings. Good, good. You know, the labeling of being Christian, uh, Buddhist, Muslim, uh, Jewish, it's important because every spiritual path is important. Each one, when it's, uh, you know, faced with an open heart, an open mind, and with compassion and respect. But fundamentally, we are human beings. So our first duty, our first thing that we should strive for is just being good human beings, even more and before being good Christians, good Catholic, good Buddhist. I think labeling is a clear sign that the ego is in charge. <laughs> so I do, I, I like your approach, we're just human beings. All right, so why did you choose Nichiren Buddhism as your spiritual path? You had a lot of choices. What drew you to Nichiren Buddhism? That probably would require two or three of your presentations. Okay, okay. Just to make it, no, no, just to make it extremely short. Um, I was, I have a friend in Italy. Uh, she's a wonderful friend. She's like a sister to me. And she's also and an artist. She's an she, artist. And a she's an artist, an artist, a uh, uh, photographer, professional photographer. Yeah. And, and now a journalist, a professional journalist. Anyway, um, in a moment in which my life was uh, going through a, an extremely, extremely, extremely difficult moment, and you know it very well, uh, Waverly, mm -hmm. because you've been a friend of mine in that terrible moment. And she told me, why don't you start chanting Namyo Rengekyo? She's been a, she had been a Buddhist for, for a few years. I thought, at first, I sincerely thought she was crazy. See, seriously, Beverly. So, you know my situation. My life is really hanging by a thread. And what you tell me is to chant, uh, uh, you know, something or a mantra, whatever it is. And she told me, do you believe in me? Do you trust me? Yes, of course I do. Then try. And I tried. 
And this is, as I say, it would require a long time. Anyway, the changes that I saw were immediate and almost overwhelming. So I decided to get more into uh, this practice. I went down to the temple, the Nichiren Buddhist temple that we have here in Denver on Spear Boulevard, and started practicing with people there. And I started finding a inner peace that I had never found before in my entire life. Not only, but um, one of the pillars of this practice is study, studying the, the scripts, the scriptures, and the, the teachings of the previous Buddhas and our mentors. And I started finding all the answers that Catholicism and Christianity in general were not able to give me before. We, I had to, sorry, I, what I'm going to say, I'm not trying to put myself above anyone else, obviously. Neither I'm trying to dismiss other people's faith and, you know, and beliefs. I'm just explaining my own path. There were way too many things that I found unexplicable in Christianity. This wonderful, perfect God that created everything, was in responsibility of everything, of every path of our lives. And then how this is can be explained with all the bad things that we see in the world. How a wonderful, perfect God could allow an infant to die of cancer. Why a perfect God would allow wars, famine, poverty, all these things. One of my best friends, you have known him when we went together in Italy, is a priest. And I had a wonderful, I still have a wonderful relationship with him. And we often spoke about these doubts and stuff. And he told me, I have the same doubt of yours. And his response was, I just devoted entirely myself to the Lord and accept that even if I don't understand why certain events, certain things happen, I know that he knows what he's doing and he does what's best for human beings. I could have accepted this, but it was still very difficult for me instead to accept this vision. What Nietzsche and Buddhism gave me, and Buddhism in general, is an answer to these questions. And also gave me the power to be aware that I can reach my own happiness during this life that can change my karma during this life you know the difference between for example tibetan buddhism and Nichiren buddhism for tibetan buddhism reaching happiness reaching the nirvana it it's through hundreds thousands millions of lives one after the other and maybe you can get there Nichiren buddhism teaches us and it's the real word, because if you read the Lotus Sutra, it's exactly the word spoken by Shakyamuni Buddha, that we can reach and change our karma during our lifetime. Nietzsche says that we can change poison into medicine. All the bad action, all the bad thoughts, all the bad things that we may have committed in previous lives or in these lives can be changed starting immediately what we call a human revolution that bring, can bring us at a point to an, a state of absolute happiness. Absolute happiness wells forth from within ourselves. And it is the moment in which we are not influenced by external conditions anymore. We all have problems. We all go through problems. And happiness depends on how we perceive and deal with them. This 
when we reach this state, we don't escape problems. Problems are with us. The four, you know, uh, big issues of each life, which are birth, suffering, or disease, uh, getting older, and death are inescapable. The difference is that we in Nietzsche Buddhism have a way to deal with this, with all these, and accept them and deal with them and still have a deep, convinced joy that we can deal with each one and all the other problems that we face in life. And being awakened, being a Buddha, each one of us in Nietzsche Buddhism is a Buddha. We all have Buddhahood. It's up to us to bring it forth. Many people live without even realizing this. Others realize it, but don't do enough to bring it forth. Others strive to bring it forth. Being awakened, being a Buddha is the condition of inexhaustible wisdom, life force, life condition courage and compassion becoming a buddha means becoming a person who exhibits all those qualities and is deeply happy and fulfilled this is what nietzsche and buddhism, buddhism gave me thank you very much marco you're very we welcome appreciate your thank you very much for to share your having me share this, this.